I guess I can meet your father. And I was <laughs> and he said I'll meet you here, so welcome. Alright, so just before we begin, uh, this, ca this question of so what can we do, uh, in the past I think we have been very cavalier and um, ready to jump and tell people what we think they should do. And I think we've started taking a few steps back from this approach. The reason being is you know your own churches, you know your own community, and you know the best way to engage with yourselves about this subject. So we're not really in the business of giving marching orders, but we're more in the business of asking questions and giving suggestions. So I think that we have sort of done most of our work, which is to come here and share our experience with you. And it's sort of your responsibility now to reflect and say, well, what can I do? Or what can we do? And um, just before we begin, it's also important to mention <coughs> For us, this isn't just another conference, it's not just an educational seminar, this is something where we are looking to build a partnership. Uh, I, I think Jonathan uh, expressed this very, uh, very, he articulated this very clearly. We see a direct connection with you. And so, we don't want this to be another conference that was very interesting and very challenging and then to go home and not address this in any way. And so, before we begin, we're putting most of the responsibility on you to reflect and think what you would like to do and what are the needs of your community in relation to this subject. However, we have some suggestions and we're happy to work with you on that as well. So you can come and communicate with us and have a discussion. Is, is this helpful? Do you think this will be successful? What's your experience if we take these actions? And so this is sort of what we want to go through today. Do you want to use the mic? Are you, happy are you all able to hear me? Yes. Sir. Yeah, yeah. because that's my preference is not to use the mic, but if I have to, I will. Uh, I think if you're using it, then so, we want to ask this question. If you haven't thought, reflected on this before, what approach has your church, your organization, your different circles, what approach have they adopted to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Right? Is this something that's even being discussed? Is this a conversation that you are having more or less regularly? Is this a challenge that you're engaging with? And if your different groups have taken a specific theological or political stance, are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? Which is something that we have repeated time and time again over the past two days. So I think that a good first step is to go through an internal process of what have we actually been doing and saying, thinking about Palestinians, about Israel, about the theology that we have been discussing. The next thing is that a question that is, I think, a challenging one. Is my theology a blessing to both peoples living in the land? So can I help provide hope for Palestinians? Can I provide hope for Israelis? And so I think this is probably the biggest question that is worth leading with. Is my theology blessing both peoples? <coughs> or is my theology contributing to the pain and suffering a certain group of people. Now we have come and we've expressed what theology we think is harming our community. Now it's your turn to reflect on have we taken part in that? Or have, <coughs> has our church, have our circles, have our areas of influence? Now if my church slash organization does not take any steps regarding the ongoing situation in the land of the Bible, should it, right? So if we have been passive, if we haven't spoken out the way we should have, if we, should, if we haven't really studied this issue, should we? The church has a responsibility to speak with a prophetic voice. What is the prophetic voice that needs to come out of South Africa? And specifically the evangelical church. And I think, we think, that South Africa, more so than many others, has a role to play. 
There are other countries, other churches that don't have the platform, does not have the experience, does, hasn't gone through the process like you have. And so you're in a unique position. And as I say, we care what you think, and I believe that there's many uh, communities, many countries, many churches around the world that care what you think too. And so this is really important. And when we think of advocating for those who are suffering injustice, I think that's, that's a privilege to be able to speak on their behalf and to be heard. We encourage you all to come and visit us. If you don't agree, if you don't believe what we are saying, if you're not convinced, or even if you are, come and visit and see for yourselves. We, a frustration we have is that many times, I think as Munder had mentioned yesterday, when there are conferences that discuss the conflict and discuss the theology of the land, we are not given a seat at the table. And we are not in the business of doing the same. And so we are saying we have nothing to hide, and we want you to hear all the different sides and come to your own conclusion. So come and visit us. Come and walk side by side with us. Uh, the offices where I work are in the middle of the old city, right next to all the major holy sites. And every day when I walk back and forth to work, I have to swim through a sea of tourists. And these tourists don't see me, right? They come, I think, I love the, verb, the, the term that Munda used, they are running where Jesus walked. When, when Jesus walked in the land of the Bible, he walked shoulder to shoulder with the people there. He was walking side by side with them in their context, in their suffering. And so we want people to do the same. And the hotel that I go past from my house to my work has a big flag of South Africa because there's so many South African tourists <coughs> coming to see Jerusalem, to see the holy sites, and they're not engaged with us. And it would be our honor to host you the same way that we have received such generous hospitality here, which is also within our culture, it would be a privilege for us to host you. <coughs> the Bethlehem Bible College is more than happy to provide information, accommodation, and help to you in your visit. Right, Munda? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the guest house of the Did you go ahead? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, let's see the microphone. Uh, as I said um, earlier, and uh, we don't want people to s stop coming and visit, but um, one of the factors in, in the, this pilgrimage industry is, is, the, is the economical factor. Because we get the, 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 the crumbs. We get the crumbs as a Palestinian community from this tourism industry. Mm. The vast majority, listen to this, the vast majority of Christian pilgrims who come to visit the Holy Land spend at best two hours in Bethlehem. Mm. Think of that. Uh, what we do at the Bible College is, and other Christian organizations and uh, Palestinian organizations is, we are willing to uh, help you with the itinerary, where uh, you know you spend almost equal time on both sides. You listen to, you visit the major holy sites, uh, but at the same time you do, you you get exposed to all perspectives. Okay. You listen to Jewish, Muslim, and Christian scholars. That's right. You visit Israeli sites and, and Palestinian sites, and then uh, we are willing and happy to offer also uh, lectures like this on the Bible and the life from a Palestinian Christian perspective. So you can be based at the Bible College, and every day you go to a place. In the morning you listen to a talk, and then go to that place. We will help with the logistics, the hotels, the food, everything. The tour guides. Uh, the tour guides. Our, by the way, we train tour guides at the Bible College, so our graduates will be more than happy to take you around. Uh, in other words, let us be your hosts. Uh, it's part of our culture to be good and hospitable. Yeah. Those who visited and stayed at the Bible College can testify to that. We will be more than happy. If it's a student group, if it's a pastor's group, if it's a small 
congregation group of 15, 20 people, even 12 people, we will be more than happy to assist you from A to Z uh, mm -hmm. in, this, uh, in, this, in your pilgrimage. Uh, and, and again, imagine the transform transformative power these pilgrimage can have, where rather than just being for, you know, because let's, let's be honest, a lot of money is invested in this. Yeah. What if, if this money is now channeled into peacemaking initiatives uh, and, 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 and helps, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, help the church worldwide to be agents of peace in, in our part of the world. So we have a whole office dedicated to that, uh, and, and we will be more than happy to help you with. Uh, by the way, another thing you can do, sorry, to, in addition to that, uh, one of the things you should speak about, you know, you visit churches. That's wonderful that you visit the place where Jesus was born at the resurrection. Why don't you live, visit a living church? Spend time with a Palestinian Christian community. Stealing my lines. Stealing all my lines. The Lutheran Church. Wow. Thank you, Mother. I think. Um, uh, so I will skip this point. <laughs> uh, but it is visiting and walking where Jesus and other biblical stories took place is amazing. I don't, we don't want to play that down at all. Yeah, we just think that there's so much more that you can experience alongside these things. And your journey can be one that encourages justice and peace in the Holy Land. Like many things in the conflict, um, everything is polarized, right? And so even the tourist trap. And many of you have already uh, expressed your experiences of being limited to one side yeah. and not knowing. And this is not an accident. These are very carefully designed to keep you away from our community. And so we are saying that this is part of our segregation, it's part of our racial discrimination, and therefore we don't accept it. Now, when we think of pilgrimage, pilgrimage is a journey. It's a journey to encounter God. And so in your, your journey of encountering God, it can be done in many different ways. And when we think of pilgrimage, we think of you as this as a journey that can encourage justice and peace. So as individuals and in congregations, we are in positions to practice this spirituality and to study our immediate context to discern where and how best to engage deepest or most pressing needs. In other words, your visit can be intentional on engaging with the living stones. When we look around us, what do we see? Where are the human needs that call for our attention, engagement, and love? That is where the pilgrimage begins. So our pilgrimage is not like going through a museum. It's something deeper, something more impactful, something more significant. Now, as part of what we would like to suggest, um, we have come up with a very, very basic, basic package of what a pilgrimage could look like for you. It's not what I would pick as an ideal, it's something that we would pick as a minimum. <coughs> and we would like to include in this pilgrimage uh, your participation in Christ at the Checkpoint Conference 2020, taking place next year between June 5th and June 9th. Now, most of you have posters on your table. For those that don't, we have some extra, which have the dates of this conference. And Christ at the Checkpoint is really unique. It's a conference that began almost 10 years ago that is saying, what is our response as Palestinian Christian evangelicals to our situation? How can we engage with the international evangelical church um, in our context. And so the conference began as a dialogue, and we very much try to continue it this way. So it's, it brings a rich variety of speakers from all around the world, including international speakers and local speakers. And we even bring speakers who disagree with us. It is important for us, with every single conference, to bring at least one Christian Zionist speaker to engage with us or to engage on a certain topic. I can't think of a single Christian Zionist conference or organization that does the same with us. And so it's important for us 
to include people who we disagree with, sometimes disagree with completely, and bring them to the table too, in order to have a discussion. So the conference includes day trips, workshops, and worship with local believers. And I would like to run with you through what a draft conference might be like. Um, and for the 2020 conference, the subject is hope and resilience in a broken world. So, one moment. So what you are seeing now, no one else has seen actually, because this is a draft program. And so it's subject to change. But it's to give you a flavor. And so, although you can't see, I'm hoping you get a taste. And each day of the conference has a theme. Day one is welcome and celebration. So what we have is we have an opening session where we're celebrating the fact that people have come to hear and engage with us in fellowship. And we also give introductions to the history of the conflict. So Israeli-Palestinian Conflict 101 and 201. So what is the history? What are the contemporary issues we are facing now? Day two is awareness and interpret. And here we start raising awareness and interpreting the context around us. So some of the subjects, again, these are all subject to change. Uh, is 100 years of conflict, what has the impact been on the Palestinian church? Western Christians and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a critical analysis. Well, how has the West, what, what exactly has the West done to contribute either to the solution or the problem of the conflict? And mapping a Palestinian Christian response. And then hopefully we will have a debate at the end of the day between a Palestinian Christian and a Christian Zionist. In the past we have done this with a Messianic Jew. We hope to do this again in the future. Day three is reaching out. So this is a Sunday. We would like to split up all the conference to go to different types of Palestinian churches to see how they worship. How do they spend their Sunday? This is both in evangelical churches and in the nominal churches. Afterwards, there's lots of optional traditional, traditional churches. <laughs> My apologies. And then Sunday afternoon, we have different optional uh, tours around Bethlehem, different activities, whether it's going to see how olive wood souvenirs are made in the uh, workshops, uh, a walking tour of Bethlehem, visiting different types of Palestinian Christian communities, and then a final worship at the wall at the end of the day. Day four is in resilience and hope. And here we want to discuss how are we cultivating hope and resilience in a situation where we feel there is none. So what is resilience and hope from a biblical perspective? Uh, what is resilience and hope from a young adult Palestinian's perspective? A uh, case study of resilience for women and Palestinian women specifically. And a full day of workshops diving deeper into different subjects. And then a case study of resilience within the African American community, followed hopefully uh, by Sharif, um, giving a Palestinian perspective on this. And then our final day of conclusion. What is our hope for the future? What are young people asking and how are we addressing the questions that they are putting to us? And then is peace possible? Is this something we should even be pursuing? So again, these are all subject to change because we're still working on the program with the speakers. But the idea is to really immerse you, not only into the different subjects that we are covering, but in this there are also day trips. Every morning you have the possibility to go to a checkpoint and experience what is the checkpoint experience for an average Palestinian early in the morning. We also have day trips that take you to Hebron, where you can see, for example, a street which is literally split between the Jewish side and the Palestinian side. You cannot, it is split by ethnicity to show you the harshest conditions of the occupation. And so this would be part of your trip. In other words, you would have, you would see the holy sites, but you would also engage with us. And just before um, 
we move on to discuss the details of that. One moment. Where's my mouse? So this is what it would look like. Now this, for me, is a type of schedule that would engage with us the least, but it's just to give you a picture of what a tour like this could look like. So day one, you would arrive at the airport and then come to Jerusalem, where you could go to the Mount of Olives, Shrine of the Book, and see all the major sorts of uh, pilgrimage sites around the old city. Day three, again, these are also all subject to change, we take you to the Dead Sea, the lowest place on Earth, uh, and to show you Qumran, places where the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, also were discovered, and Jericho. Day four is to come back to Jerusalem and Bethlehem. In Jerusalem, you will see the old city, all the holiest sites, so Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Il Aqsa Mosque, the Wailing Wall, to see all the sort of center hard point of the Holy Land. And then to join us for the conference in Bethlehem for the next uh, five days. Once the conference is concluded, uh, to go to the Galilee to see Caesarea and to uh, eat, have, let's see, uh, drive through Mount Carmel and see more holy sites in the Galilee area, including Tiberias. Day nine is the Sea of Galilee, where you go on a boat trip on the Sea of Galilee and uh, Capernaum, and Mount of the Beatitudes, and then return home to South Africa. Now, this one is a heavy pilgrimage package, right? But all of these things can be customized and changed. You can reduce a day here, you can engage with more of the local population, more church visits, all of these things can be customized. But it's just to give you an idea of what a basic package could include. And I think this is a pretty rich package. You see most of the main holy sites, and you engage with the local community. Now, some of you are probably thinking, how much does that cost, right? And so, this is, as a package, includes um, three nights in Jerusalem, four nights in Bethlehem during the conference, and two nights in Tiberias. The cost per person for sharing a double room for a minimum of 15, is 1,100 US dollars. This includes all the airport assistance, arrival and departure assistance, all the accommodation, breakfasts and dinners, it does not include lunch. It includes um, transportation to all the different holy sites. It includes uh, professional uh, tour guides, entrance fees to all the holy sites, uh, boat ride to the Sea of Galilee, assistance in the hotel, and different map material, right? So this is, for those of you that work in the tourism industry, you can compare these prices to other tour prices and, and make your own mind about uh, uh, the value of this, which I think is quite good. Now, before we can continue. Plus airline. No, it doesn't include the airline. It includes. It does not no. include. So, before, before I continue with some more things that we can do, uh, there's a few people here who have attended this conference who have already been to Christ at the Checkpoint. Uh, there's actually quite a few people. Uh, we have asked two people to come and share with you very briefly what their experience was in 2018. So can I invite uh, Mackenzie and Alan just to come up uh, real quick? <coughs> so um, we actually had the opportunity to meet um, last conference, and we're so happy to see that you have joined us uh, for this conference as well. So perhaps if I begin with you, Alan, would you be willing to share just one or two minutes what your experience was in the previous Christ at the Checkpoint Conference? Sure. Well, that's really an eye-opening experience being, being there in, in Bethlehem. Actually, my experience started before the conference because I, I took the, 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 the least... Uh, um, I'm the, the world's worst tourist. I actually 
took a Palestinian bus from Jerusalem to, to Ramallah, spent some time in Ramallah, had a tour around Ramallah, was explained about their, the water situation, that the Palestinians have water tanks, and if they miss their water, um, that, that comes twice a week. Then they, then they run out of water, or they, have, they have to borrow water, while they pointed out the settlement that can be seen from, from the main road, just over the hill, has water 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And um, so, so being there, then we went to a, a refugee camp um, in Ramallah. I also, from, from Ramallah, took a Palestinian shared taxi through the West Bank, and that's how I got to Bethlehem, rather than taking the tourist, tourist route. So like I said, I'm probably the world's worst tourist, and yes, I did miss you in old city in Jerusalem, but I did uh, spend time on that Ishtar with, a, with a, a Muslim family in the old city that uh, I invited myself to. <laughs> but, um, no, I didn't exactly invite myself to. But all these experiences, even before I got there, was an enriching experience to say, you know, a lot of people, before I went, were sending me messages, some Africans were saying, do you really want to go to Palestine? That's not, not safe there, and so on. And I said, you know what, I live in South Africa, <laughs> what's not safe? Um, <laughs> so, you know, so basically, it was an, a wonderful time. To tell the truth, I can't remember all the sessions at the Christ at the checkpoint. But, they, but what happens there, and what was really enriching as well, was that they take us on these tours. They take us to the villages and show us what happens in the villages. They take us through the, the checkpoints. They take us um, to, to show a, a Palestinian village um, that's been pressurized by a settlement right next door. A Palestinian village where they, they legitimately, and the Israeli law, own, because I think it's in sector, sector 3, is, is area C, which is Israeli owned, apparently under Israeli law. So even under Israeli law, that this, these Palestinians can't be moved. And they show us how uh, the only way, uh, the only thing that these settlers can do is pressurize them and the pressure that they've been put under. And we were on the bus going there, and uh, there's a Korean chap sitting next to me, and we all had our caps because of the sun. He had a bicycle helmet. I thought, what are you taking a bicycle helmet for? Um, you know, that's not going to help with the sun. He said, no, the last time one of his friends went on, on the strip, and the settlers threw rocks at them and hit one of his friends on the, on the head. And so they, so they had the upfront experience with the settlers' aggression just because of people visiting the Palestinian village. And going through the checkpoint is another eye um, but I don't want to spend more time. Uh, that really is something that you have to experience because everything is explained um, of what they, the Palestinians go to, waiting for hours in the morning just to get to work in the morning if they work in Jerusalem, um, which is really literally 10 minutes away, um, and so on. So these are, so it's more than a conference where you have speakers. It's something upfront, practical, hands-on, where you, where you connect with people on what, what the Palestinian people are going through. And I really recommend it. Um, yeah, like Alan, my journey starts before the conference. Um, so I was raised in a home where my father comes from a Jewish family. My mother comes from a Christian family. Um, but we didn't grow up really practicing any religion. Um, I came to Christianity on my own. But um, I was, it wasn't until I had never given any thought to Israel. My family never spoke about Israel or anything like that until I came to South Africa. Um, I had a friend ask me, a South African friend asked me, oh, you're Jewish, you must be pro-Israel. And I said, I don't know what that means. And immediately after, I thought, you should know what that means. Um, and so I began kind of doing research, and I had a friend recommend the conference to me. Um, and so I decided to go, and I'm so thankful that I did. Um, the conference for me, like Alan, was really impactful. Um, for the tours, especially when we went on the field trips, uh, we went to many different villages, and um, I think something that was really impactful for me, just a short 
quick story was that when we went to a village, I believe it was called Nabi Sabah, um, that was very impactful for me because uh, when we got to the tour, they said the family we are visiting and we will be hearing from is observing Ramadan. Please leave your drinks on the bus. And it was a very hot day. They gave us the information and then this Muslim family welcomed us to their home. And what was really impactful for me is that they came around and they served us all cool drink. And they were observing Ramadan, so they weren't having any. But the hospitality shown to us, and this was a family that had been described as seen as a propaganda machine or as a threat. We're just so thankful that we came to their village, um, that they showed us so much hospitality and they shared honestly. This was something that really impacted me as well as um, the friendships that I was able to make the students from the Bethlehem Bible College and the hospitality received in the midst of a situation that is um, yeah, such an, an oppressive reality that you see very plainly. Um, and so going home for me, the struggle was, what will I say to my family? And I thought the pushback would come from my Jewish family, but when I went home, um, they were very receptive and very understanding and empathetic. It, it was actually, um, the pushback I received was from my Christian grandparents and members of their church congregation. Um, but something amidst all of that pushback that really stayed with me was I was there and I saw it. And that couldn't be argued away. The friendships that I made, the hospitality that I received, the hope that I saw um, in the Palestinian people, and the realities of the oppressive occupation. And those images and that experience was something that um, has stuck with me and couldn't be argued away because I was there and I saw it and I experienced it. Um, so, and as much as even the checkpoint probably being on their best behavior when we were there seeing still how oppressive the realities of the occupation were. Um, and so that's why I would recommend anybody to go to this conference. And um, I would also say that it is just so important to go with an open mind and to really value the person in front of you and the person telling their story in front of you rather than your preconceived ideas about the conflict. So I would really recommend this um, conference. Mm. So we hope that both of these experiences have increased your appetite to come and join us in 2020. And our basic message is, in this conference, is we call upon evangelical Christians everywhere to join us in the hope that we can build a better world where goodness and truth reign free and where the love and fairness of God are common. And so we invite you all to join us as a South African group for 2020 to experience um, to walk shoulder to shoulder with us, to experience the land of the Bible, to see the sights, to walk where Jesus walked, but also to walk with us. And just as some closing points before we open it up further. Uh, many people have been asking for resources. Now, uh, as we have a lot of Palestinian Christians who have written, who are uh, creating contextual theology in our situation, we've produced a lot of material that really, could be really, really beneficial. And I'd just like to speak of four books. There are many more than this, and when you come and visit us, you'll be able to see the full range uh, of these books. But just to give you an example, you have The Land of Christ by uh, Johanna Catanasio. This is really good for a light reading of the theology of the land. If you want to dive in much deeper into the theology, you can be brave enough to buy Mundo's book and read through it. Um, Alex Awad, who is actually the founder of the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference, along with the uh, faculty of the Bethlehem Bible College, has written the history of the conflict of the Palestinian people through uh, the story of his family, and specifically his mother. And it's called Palestinian Memories. Uh, it's a really, really interesting book, and a really courageous woman. Now, for those of you that are interested more in reconciliation, we have Through My Enemy's Eyes. This is written by Salim Unair and Lisa Loden. It's a Palestinian Christian and a Messianic Jew 
who have come together to write a joint historical narrative, if you can imagine such a thing, uh, in this book. They write together the history of the conflict. They write about the history and theology of Palestinian Christians, the history and theology of Messianic Jews, and the last chapter is a theology of reconciliation. So this is just to give you a taste of some of the material that is being produced uh, by Palestinian Christians and other believers in the Holy Land. Now I'd also like to encourage you, all available on Amazon, all available on Amazon, thank you. Uh, I'd also like to encourage you on the leaflets that you have, you have the website of Christ at the Checkpoint, but you also have the Facebook and YouTube uh, addresses for Christ at the Checkpoint. All the previous sessions that have been done since 2010 are available online. We're talking about hours, hours of material that you can engage with even if you cannot join us. And if you follow us on Facebook, you will see that the Facebook page regularly brings up different subjects and different videos from previous years, and it also includes different articles and different reflections on the ongoing conflict. Now, another basic thing, these are some basic things that we would like to recommend that you can do for us, and that is to pray. To pray for the Palestinian Christian community, to pray for the Messianic Jewish community, to pray for peace and justice to be done in the land. We also want you to share our stories. We want you to amplify our voices. We cannot go around and speak. We do not have the means to reach and influence the way that other groups have. And so we depend on our partnership with you to share the stories that you have heard for the past two days, to share the information, and to include us in your discussions. <coughs> We, would, we really want to partner with you. We want to invest in each other. As we have said, this has mostly been us speaking to you, but we know that you have a lot to share with us. And so perhaps this isn't the best format to do it, but we want to hear from you in the future. So we very much hope that you stay in touch with us and that you stay in contact with us. Lastly, <coughs> there is a very good documentary video can expose some of the theological uh, issues that we have tackled today, and it's called "With God on Our Side." Now, I don't have the uh, I don't have the ability to show you the video. It's about an hour and a half, and it unpacks the sort of theological paradigms that Yusuf and Wunder have addressed, and it also includes the perspectives of Palestinian Christians. So, "With God on Our Side" is a really powerful video. Yes, yeah, sorry, I see a hand in the back. Just to say, it's available on YouTube as well. Yeah, it's available probably illegally, but it's available on YouTube. So if you look for "With God on Our Side, Israel Palestine," you can find it on YouTube. It's worth your 90 minutes. So these are some first steps that we would like you to engage with, with the theology, with the advocacy, and with coming and visiting us. But I'm sure that there are many, many other things that can be done. But as I said at the beginning of this talk, we are leaving it up to you to analyze and decide what makes the most sense for my church, what makes the most sense for my organization. And so we leave it really up to you based on what you have heard. Now you, you can't say that I didn't know. Right? So if this is your first time hearing this, now you know. And now we believe it's your responsibility to continue and engage. So this is it for me, and I think there's, we want to use the rest of the time to hear from you. How have these two days been for you? Have these been, have it, has it been frustrating, confusing? Has it been enlightening? Are you happy? Are you, are you angry? We, we want to hear from you what, this, what these two days have been for you, because it will really help us to understand you better. Yeah, this is the part of our conversation, so my brother had a contribution he wanted to make a name. Whoever else wants to contribute, we have some time. Uh, I don't know where to start, but I am Elias, and uh, I'm with Apostle Banda and his wife and my wife, and we're from our Phenomenal Covenant Church. And we've been dealing with the subject since 2017. Uh, up until now, to the extent that it has been taught in the church, 
we've had activist sessions once a quarter where we gather part of the members of the church just to expose them to, to the theology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We, we've been dealing with the matter for the past three years, starting in 2017. We have conducted workshops once a quarter over the past two and a half years in conducting the theology with the members of our church and a couple of other additional churches. Uh, however, allow me to say I heard Tian's testimony yesterday, and I guess it's all because it's my, it might not be a complete testimony, but I couldn't help asking myself, now that Tian has had an opportunity of seeing himself and what he would have been like, it would truly help to know what reconciliation steps he has taken since that experience, especially between black folk and white folk in South Africa. Secondly, he proposes a non-theological approach to pursuing justice. And uh, I tend to disagree if that is the proposition. And the reason being that in my understanding the root of the injustice, which stems from Zionism, is Christian Zionism. And the problem with Christian Zionism is not a political problem, it's a theological problem. So I cannot see how we can set aside issues of theology, which implies doctrine, and try and address the matter. Thirdly, I respect where you guys come from, and I respect the tonality of your presentations. But at times it would seem like we walk on eggs, and we don't want to call spade a spade. Uh, so as much as one agrees to the quest for reconciliation, the question still remains, what is the foundation of such reconciliation? Is it the word of truth, or is it a compromise foundation? Because you are seeking to reconcile with a people who do not necessarily believe in your Messiah. And therefore, when we go out into the desert, what is the foundation of reconciliation? Is it messianic, or is it compromise? And if it is compromise, I would imagine there's some philosophy that we employ. In you know, I've written here, is my theology a blessing to both? In the ideal world, we would love it to be. But truth be told, the correct theology, and we are in agreement with you guys, it is correct. It can never be a blessing to both. Because even though it is truth in its theological content, the fact of the matter is there are those who might view it as heretic. And those who might view it as heretic are both members of the body of Christ as we speak and those who are Jews. So yes, we would like it to be viewed as a blessing to both, but the reality of the matter is at any time truth will always be perceived in a different way by others. Uh, I don't know whether to move on to the next one, but anyway, uh, this is the thought. It's a thought. The obsolescence of the old covenant includes the desolation of Israel. Yes. Can I? I I, I, know, I know that we have a lot to talk about. Okay. And some of the thoughts that you have, I'd like us to engage in the panel discussion. Okay. But for now, I think rather than go into the, de the details of what the theology is, 
We want to hear how this has been, okay. and some of the points that you have said have been well received. Okay. Okay. Can I say the last point there before this one? Okay. We need to treat the elephant in the room as South Africans. And the fact is, right here, right now, there's an issue relating to reconciliation and an issue relating to land. And taking from what Mantha presented earlier, I would like to envisage a scenario where the likes of TSA, the likes of South African Council of Churches, develop a shared land theology on behalf of the church in South Africa and all other bodies and present that to the politicians and the ruling parties as a proposition of what the church can bring forth to the table in resolving the issue of land. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a very important issue. That's a practical thing we can do. That's a very important thing. I realize that because that's something that I noticed, and I was just wondering how we could manage that. And so that's a good proposal, Moss, that we could put onto our agenda for tomorrow's meeting to see how we can go forward. We're going to have the Secretary of the South African Council of Churches here in a few minutes, and we'll welcome him. Do you want to respond to something? Uh, well, I would love to respond, but, but I appreciate, I think this is a time for us to listen and then we can have more conversation on this later, specifically in my case on the reconciliation, uh, which, which I have a lot to say. Um, so I think I saw a hand all the way at the back. Um, so just a reminder, this is a, dis a discussion about how these past day two days have been for you and, and your experience. Great, thanks so much. Um, I, in terms of answering the question, what, what do we do now? I just wanted to speak to that uh, for a moment. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have in South Africa is the issue of identity, which is something I think we need to be the cognizance of. Uh, part of the part of the existence of South Africa was the denial of belief, the idea of denial of belief, um, that we are different, and, and that difference was emphasized, so all emphasized. So, so we have an issue of identity as South Africans. And so in terms of dealing with your situation, one of our challenges is how we receive you. So first of all, when I went to, to Palestine in 2016, it was a cultural shock for me. Because my perception of Palestinians is not women with the hair cut to South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so Shereen is out of line. <laughs> so, so the perception is that it's Hamas, it's PLO, it's Fatah, it's Yasser Arafat, it's not Christian. Wow. And that is our challenge that we, that we struck in with as evangelical Christians to start over. And so we need to first of all overcome that challenge for South Africans. Is, and, and one of the things I propose to ask you is that we need to take a picture of all of you here. Now, and I'm serious, as a way forward. It's a small thing, but if we could take a picture of all of you and post it on our social media platforms, which we finished, with maybe a small caption or whatever, but these are our brothers and our sisters that you're praying for. <coughs> that would help our cause as well. Our challenge is, is that in South Africa at the moment, we, this is a very hot topic. We're sitting with a situation that the major Christian party in South Africa is very pro-Palestinian. Not just pro-Palestinian, very pro-Palestinian. Pro-Israel. Pro sorry, pro-Israel. It's very pro-Israel. Uh, the leader of that party has his children as leaders within the Zionist movement. And so everything that we say that is pro-Palestinian is, is, is being demonized. And that's one of our main challenges. The Anglican Church in South Africa a few weeks ago made a ruling that they will support the Palestinian cause. They have been demonized by the mainline uh, evangelical media. And everybody is jumping on the bandwagon saying that this is a thing from hell. And that's the challenge that we are facing with that. And, and I think it's important that we understand that context as well, in terms of how do we move forward. For us as TISA, our constituency is very conservative and very pro israel And so we, for, it's going to be a challenge for us but it's a challenge that's quite insurmountable, but it is a challenge. But I think it's important that you understand that challenge and you understand that context as well. So 
one of the, the key things that I think that we need to do is to be able to present a picture, an alternative picture, to present Christianity within the Palestinian context. That we don't have, we've never had. And that for us is one of the things that I think, and that's why I'm saying, if we can just get a picture of you, because Jack, if I take you now and I drop you, and I drop you in one of our suburbs down the road, you'll be one of the perfect South Africans, immediately. You are not a, you are, you are not, you are, you are not an, oppro, an oppressed individual. And, and that's the challenge that we have as South Africans. I think it's important that we understand that context. You're encouraging me to emigrate, is what you're saying. You won't be class one, you'll be class example. Thank you. Uh, let me just say real quick, uh, before, before we move on, on the website of this conference, holylandconference.co.za, is a video of most of the speakers today together that you can see speaking about being Palestinian Christians. So these pictures exist of us, they're just not very well spread. So if you, if you please, please go to the website, holylandconference.co.za, our video is there with I think half of the speakers here today and more of the people within our community who couldn't join us. So please visit the website and view the video. It's also available on our Facebook page. Yeah. And also the, the hashtag of yesterday was more of a yeah. The hashtag also in includes sharing uh, our faces and our messages. Yeah, sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Clinton Brains. Um, I don't express appreciation to Tisa and to our Palestinian brothers and sisters uh, and everyone who's here for actually showing up. Um, I think there's um, a great deal to be said about the value of just showing up rather than staying away and retreating from the difficult issues. <coughs> Second thing is to say that um, I really appreciate it from uh, Palestinian Christians in this conference um, sharing the, 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 the social uh, realities, the harsh realities on the ground that was extremely important but also not shying away from the biblical and theological mm. engagement. Because often in contexts uh, that I've been, um, the social stuff is enough to disturb us. I mean, I shouldn't need a biblical text to, um, to, to, to make me want to save life, uh, to make me not to want to support death and destruction and bombing. But at the same time, um, this is important for evangelical Christians, it's important for, for people of faith to be able to uh, make sense of the, the sacred text, the biblical text, the theological paradigms, and I think um, uh, you really did a good job of actually taking us uh, through that. And then thirdly, quickly to say that, um, also challenging us with the, the, the ethical quality of our theology, is it life denying or is it life affirming? Uh, is it life destroying or is it life transforming? Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind, especially when we, we grapple with difficult issues and we don't know how to proceed. At the end of the day, what is that ethical impact, that public impact of our of international law is complied with? Instead of deliberating about future scenarios and, and uh, not to invalidate the reconciliation discourse, you know, if we were stuck in apartheid South Africa and we still wanted to debate, okay, what, what if we give up on this apartheid thing? What's going to happen? What are we going to do with this people? What happens if they react like, like this and like that? We will still be in apartheid South Africa. So I think it's, it's also that um, you need to get the elephant off the, your tail. Any other thoughts about the past two days? Any other reflections on how what the experience has been, yes. Thank you, my name is Marisha Singh and unfortunately I wasn't here yesterday, but my partner Seth was here, shared with me about uh, what, what took place. So I'll speak more about what I heard today. Thank you so much for uh, just the Christ-centered, biblical, theological aspect that uh, my brother brought in the morning and then to you as well now. I think contextual theology is so key and instrumental in us transforming whatever injustices we face in the world. And for me, uh, growing up, 
as a Hindu and then becoming a Christian and let me say more of a, not exactly a follower of Christ but accepting a Christianity which was more Christendom. Uh, I've come to really then go back to uh, theologians and contextual theologies, whether it's black liberation theologies or theologies from the margin, third world theologians, who really speak to issues that challenge then any injustices that we face. And I, and I got a sense of that when you spoke, uh, both of you spoke today. So thank you for that. I would say that, for example, the land, if we look at uh, contextual theologies, what people from maybe India or Africa or even Native American theologies would offer is understanding of the land not just has something to be possessed. It's a loving being. It's who we are. And that then challenges the way we think about the land. For here, South Africa itself, and then for the Middle East as well. You know, it becomes a whole new uh, thinking. And so I think that needs to be more robust in our understanding of the land and how we bring that whole aspect about. It's not just about survival and production, it's then a living being. And so I'm really uh, thankful for that. The other thing that I wanted to, uh, a little bit about what, uh, sorry, the brother there was talking about, and it, it reminded me of what we went through about two or three years in our church community, where this was a kind of a new thing of understanding that they are Palestinian Christians. And so we watched the video, The Stones Cry Out. Yeah. And uh, uh, for, for my husband and I, we were kind of dealing with this issue for a long time because we grew up in an interfaith uh, community. But what was tough for us is that people in our church were only willing to get involved in the struggle because it was then Christian people. Mm. And that's not acceptable. Yeah. Not one, but so because it was a Christian child dying, they were fine, but if it was a Muslim child died, then no. And we was refrained from doing that because in South Africa we had Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Jewish fighting against the struggle. And so I would encourage you and, and my brother there and for you there that we cannot just say Palestinian Christians. And I understand we are grounded in our in the Jesus Christ and that's our cornerstone and our foundation. But when we say pray for Palestinian Christians, pray for Messianic Jews, we have to say pray for our Muslim brothers and sisters too. It has to be included. So when we put that picture up, whatever, whenever you can, as Palestinian Christians, show that you are holding the hand of your Muslim brother and sister. Because that's what the love of Christ is. It shows that. And so I would encourage you in that way. Because I found that a bit lacking in terms of the presentation. Because I come from an interfaith uh, household, an interfaith community, third world theologians challenge us in that way that the interfaith dialogue then becomes very, very important in how we work together. I'm sure you do a lot of work with that already because you can't, you want an interfaith community yourselves. So talk more about that as well. Even for us, the evangelical Christians who find it so hard to have interfaith dialogues, we need it because that's what true justice is about. Thank you. Uh, and we missed you yesterday. We really yeah. did. Uh, and I think I think that um, if you would have come yesterday, you would have seen this addressed a bit more than it has been addressed today, because the idea of how we are engaging is on the specific platform that we meet today. Mm -hmm. But it, but I want to make it clear that it, I'm sorry if it came across that we take no interest, but that we do not partner with people outside of our own community. I want to assure you that that's not the case. Thank you very much. My name is Lerato. Um, just answering the question, how was yesterday and today for, for me? I am so traumatized and uh, everyone was <laughs> so lucky at me. <laughs> he mentioned the issue of therapy yesterday and he, he said it in passing, but the reality is I'm shocked. And uh, at some stage I felt so, so small as a Christian that we were so uh, misinformed. The other thing not to be informed is a different one to be misinformed. Mm -hmm. That we even also probably took this theology and that's why we preached and we, we gave you so much confidence. And um, thank you guys for coming because myself and many of, of, of other Leratos, when we thought of Palestinians, we thought of these evil people who are out there mm -hmm. to kill us who are Muslims. 
can be for South Africans and others and uh, the kind of people who do not respect human life. Little did we know that this is what you guys are actually going through in your own country. Mm -hmm. and, and related to that, because we also went through the same. Though yours, I don't know whether should I say it's worse or it's because we hear that this is the time when we are healing, then we hear your stories now, it's taking us back there now, it's hurting even worse. So thank you very much for coming and thank you for Tisa for, for these opportunities. But after having this as well, I'm left with a question that looking at exact, exactly the, the, the response that we got when we invited people for this, I have never experienced anything like this. Usually when I send out invitations, people will at least respond <laughs> and say, what is this about? You know, but this time, nobody. <laughs> you know, um, but I'm moving forward. Okay, I'm traumatized in a, I'm in a, I am having a nice confusion because it's good for me. You know, but then moving forward as an individual, how do I do this? You know, I was sitting to Murut yesterday when we were talking about it and we keep on saying, hey guys, I mean really now, we have to go through a process of unlearning before we can learn. But then how do I do that as an individual? That's why I, I as me, I'm going to raise this again with Tisa that how we then, we then have this conversation locally moving forward so that we may have these talks amongst ourselves, maybe that we may you know, go through this process together. Because there's a lot that you shared that needs to be unpacked. Yeah. And, and we need to contextualize it as well. You know, um, yeah, but thank you for this confusion. I, I think what's <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're, happy, we're happy to confuse you. For all issues <laughs> relating to trauma, we blame solely on Max. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's his responsibility. No, let's pass it on to someone who has sorry, spoken. Uh, no, 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 sorry. sorry. No, 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 sorry. I, is it, there are other, no, no, sorry, sorry. But I think it's important that we understand. It might, it might be, but there's other people here who haven't had the chance to speak. 50 seconds. Please, please. I think I think <laughs> I apologize. I think the point that I raised is simply to, to, to say that's why I preempted it. That in South Africa, the differences between the races in South Africa were overemphasized. And all I'm saying is that our perception has always been that this was a Jewish or an Israeli and a Muslim, a Jewish and a Muslim country. And there were no Christians involved in this thing. All I'm saying is that, as my sister said as well, is the issue of the fact that our perception has been that, it, that these are Muslims uh, Antichrist, and therefore we need to support Israel. And that's really all I'm saying. I really wasn't trying to make a distinction between the fact that we need to only support because it's Christians, but really just in terms of understanding where we are coming from as other things. Clarification yeah. received. Just be before Yusuf passes it on, this is the video that I was talking about on the uh, website. We have two out of the five speakers here. And so this also helps introduce us and the different issues in the video. The video is quite long, so I'm not going to play it. But um, these are the faces of the people that we are also representing here. So please uh, go view the video, share it, engage with us. We are producing material online. We just need people to, to click on it. And so this is available on the <coughs> website. So sorry, go ahead. Good morning. My name is Amanda. I'm from the First Talk and Talk Club and Underground Academy for Open and Lifelong Learning. Um, thank you for the wonderful conference. Thank you for the centers, Dr. Shukani, Dr. Kurt, and many in the conversation. It has been a, a very enriching conference. I'd like to mention particularly the, um, the call of, of the Lord, the Lord God of Yahweh, um, uh, Jehovah, Allah, God, the Lord of creation, the call, the theology of the land. For highlighting its importance and the theology behind it, what I understand is the most fundamental and extremely important um, and needed thing 
is to end the occupation. Because we cannot deal with something that is evil. There's no negotiation with evil. We have read, we've heard, we've looked at the tactics of the occupation. It's been amnesia, it's been um, trade, it's been slavery, it's been bargaining, it's been um, Zionist uh, laws, fundamentalism, and it's all extreme abuse. There's nothing theological um, backing in that. It's a human rights issue. If I may also, with deepest respect, reflect on South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation um, hearing and commission. Many, uh, uh, one of the uh, young activists from the Cape Flats, his name was Ashley Creel. He was battered and gunned down and um, eventually um, beaten to death and found much later in his home in the Cape Flats. During the Truth and um, Reconciliation Commission, <coughs> the police officer who was responsible for doing that was questioned and he apologized. He, he said he didn't mean to kill him. So he had amnesia. He walked out of that hearing and within meters from it was laughing his head off. There's no reconciliation with evil. Um, so the only thing in my complete understanding is to end the occupation. And the only way is to be yes. Thank you. I'm afraid this is the last point because we have to take a photo together. So I thank you all for sharing. For those of you that haven't had the chance to speak yet, we will have this opportunity once we have our panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. I think that has helped us to ventilate a little bit. And I think it will give us time during lunchtime to think some more about what we want to say. It's important that we hear each other's voices. I'm going to ask that we close in prayer at this point, and then we will um, go for the picture just outside on the steps. We will take the picture and then.